Hey, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, so glad you're here. Many of you are here. Maybe you're here. How many were here last week? I'm curious. Easter Sunday. We all kind of converged on the same Sunday. It was amazing and wonderful. Some of you, maybe that was your first time with us. We had a lot of first time guests and you're back today. We're glad you're here. As noted, uh, we are launching a new series of messages. We always preach, you know, exegetically or expository preachings from the text. We'll get there today as well. Uh, but this is kind of topical in that we're going to ask a lot of questions throughout the series. This is a safe place to ask some dangerous questions. And so if you're a guest and maybe you've been to, I think sometimes we feel like churches are sort of, well, from the outside, you can ask a lot of questions. I've got a lot of questions. But once you're on the inside, like some of you, then you just stop asking questions. Like you're just supposed to believe, you're supposed to have it all figured out and you don't doubt anymore. That is not the case. We all have questions. We all have doubts. I would argue that doubt is actually a necessity uh, for a robust faith. And so we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I'm very inquisitive, always have been, real curious, and still asking a lot of questions. Um, and the Lord, what I've learned through the years is we ask, he said, you knock, it'll be open. If you seek, you'll find. And I've discovered that to be true. Uh, all the way through, um, not just college, you know, high school, college, but into my seminary work, I ended up doing um, doctoral work in apologetics, which is uh, the answer, find, knowing maybe how to find the answer to some hard, hard questions. And so we're going to talk a lot about that. I'm still on a journey with you, but this is a place where we ask really hard questions. And we want you to do that. We do it in our connect groups. We're not afraid of questions and, and doubt and all the things that we wrestle with. And what we're going to do today, we're going to ask this kind of baseline question. You saw it there. Is God real? Now, some of you here, most of us are probably theists, like most people in America, by the way. And most of you here, you're probably a theist. You believe in God. So you'd, you'd be like, is God real? Yes. Let's go to lunch. Um, game over. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. And what our hope is today is that you will not only, if you are, I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume in a crowd this size or across our campus, everybody is here, um, just believes, you know, and I, some people are that way. You, you know, people like this, maybe you're this way. I just have faith. <laughs> why, why am I asking all the questions? Let's just press on. I believe, you know, let's go. And then others of us, well, I believe, but Oh, you know, it's the prayer. Help me with my unbelief. And we all, we're all there somewhere on that spectrum. But um, there, are, there are those of us who are here who wrestle with does God exist or not? And I think most of us have been there before. And oftentimes through hard times, through crazy stuff that happens in the world, we'll address some of that today. We have questions and they're legitimate. Um, they're real questions. And we're going to ask these questions. Now, most Americans um, still is true. Believe in God. Um, you know, now, now what we're trying to do though, can we argue, if you will, towards, and I'm going to argue, but can we, can we bring evidence towards the God of the Bible, right? Is where this all will run and most explicitly seen embodied in the person of Jesus. So that's where all this goes. When you talk about revelation, um, you know, I learned this in seminary, but there's general revelation. Think of a, think of a funnel, okay? General revelation from the start is, is how God revealed himself to everyone. We're going to talk about that today, primarily through creation. Uh, this is Paul's argument we're going to look at in Romans 1, where it goes from general revelation to more specific, okay? Wow, the prophets and, and, and all who, the Bible, okay, more, more clearly. And then in the person of Jesus, the, the point of the spear, the person of Jesus revealing who God is, okay? But with all of that, and then it comes very personal to each of us. And the Spirit of God working in every heart, in every person becomes general and very specific down to us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's where all this goes. We're going to talk about, is God real? How do we know? But in, in the United States, at least, it's been stable pretty much when you look at studies and such. I look at Pew Research, among others who say for the past 80 years or so, it's been pretty, pretty, you know, 5%. I mean, there's, there's fuzzy edges on all this, but from anywhere from 3, 3%, some say a little 12%. Um, with each consecutive generation, it gets a little higher. Uh, Gen Z there, now it's something like, you know, some would say up to 12 and plus percent, and then 14% are agnostic. And, and that, that kind of runs, but it's still very small number. I have a theory there that most of us, Stacy and I were with, uh, Taylor and others with our seniors yesterday, our graduates and parents, 
uh, how to launch well and talk about how do we do that. Had an incredible time. But, but it's, it's, my theory is uh, wh- who knows much of anything when you're 20 years old, right? Now, we thought we knew everything, um, but we're still sorting out our faith. People are really scared and afraid of deconstruction. Everybody's talking about deconstructing their faith. I think we all deconstruct to some point. I think you must. I mean, Paul said, when I got older, when I started mature, I put away childish things. I don't believe that anymore. Now, we've got to do it according to Scripture and truth or everything breaks down. You need to do it in community. That's what we talked to our seniors about yesterday. Find a church, right? But all of this is to say there's, there's a baseline from which all this is launched, and it is, is God real. So in the book of Hebrews, we see this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please God apart from faith. Some of you, uh, this is the message. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. Notice, not improbable, not unlikely, impossible. So from that point, we've got to start with faith. And some of y'all, again, ah, oh, faith. You know, why can't it be like everything else in the world where it's just intellect and I just want to figure it out and give me the 10 points and three you know, reasons and all the things. And we can do all that because there's faith and reason involved in, in robust faith. But in the end, I'm starting at the end, it's faith. You're gonna, it's, it's what Soren Kierkegaard called a leap into the dark. I would argue it's, it's more than that. It's not just a leap in the dark. It's a leap that is, that is tied to rational thought, evidence, and even historical facts about all that we believe in the scriptures. So why is this the case? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists. Okay. You go, well, yeah, you have to first believe he exists. Again, this is the baseline, and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him, that he responds to those who earnestly, humbly seek him. All right. So as we come before him today, Lord, speak into our hearts. All right. We didn't check our brains in at the door, as it were, to come in here and to really think deeply about why we believe what we believe. So go ahead and turn to Romans chapter one. Uh, Romans chapter one, if you have your Bible, verses 16 through 25 is what we're going to look at. Kind of a classic uh, passage of Paul as he enters into this um, this uh, this letter to a book of, uh, uh, to, to to the Romans. Now, always we talk about this context is so important. We're, we're not just going to snag this; it doesn't come out of thin air. He's writing a letter to a group of believers, a colony of believers, community of believers in the early church, first century, and they're in Rome. Okay, that's the name. And he's saying to them, "Here's his point: as a Jew, all right." Former Pharisee, uh, Torah observant Jew, Christ has blown his mind and blew up his heart. And he's completely changed. And now he is saying, he's going to argue throughout the Bible, I mean, throughout the, this book, his letter to the Romans, that, that this righteousness now, this salvation is open to everyone. Everyone. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be this particular race or this particular group, okay? And so he's going to start uh, by saying, he starts with the end in sight. And it's this. Look at verse 16, Romans 1, 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, okay, the good news of Jesus, because it is the power of God that, that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There's the word. Uh, those who have faith believe first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So he starts the entire book here with this idea. It's all by faith, all right? It's it's first and last by faith. For the gospel, look at this, verse 17. For, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now hang on to that. This will be the first point he's making. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Some translations say from faith to faith. It means faith all the way through. Okay, from the beginning all the way through. And then again, this trips up many of us. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So this is kind of different language for us. He's a first century Jew and he's talking about righteousness. And what I want us to see here in this passage is in the, what's been called the most important theological document ever written is the book of Romans. He's going to unpack from his premise here, there's, there's a righteousness. There's a salvation that's come to us by faith, 
not by works, not even by intellect, but now he's going to set up his argument. Okay, the premise is there. Now he's going to say, let's start from general revelation, and we're going to move tighter and tighter and tighter and closer. So he, like a great apologist, he's coming at it. I mean, he's an attorney, essentially, is what he, what he was. So why all of this is appropriated by faith? That's really the question he's answering here. Why is this? Uh, the gospel. The good news of Jesus and all that he's done for us that we'll unpack along the way. So there's three things I want you to see here. He, he's going to show us God is real because there's a real righteousness that has been revealed. Now, again, that's not language we always use, but I'll, I'll explain that. There's a real revelation. He really has revealed himself. And then there's a real redemption that comes uh, with all things. And that's what he's up to is redeeming all that is broken, all that is lost in the world. Okay. And how do we pull all that together? Embedded in this argument in chapter one of Romans are what we now call classic um, arguments for the existence of God. Evidences. Um, there's like, the, if y'all have ever studied philosophy or whatever, uh, there's the teleological argument for the existence of God. Teleos is the word in the Greek that means end. Tetelestai is when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. Tele, tele, uh, teleological argument is what most of us know as um, order and design. There is order and design within creation that, that shows us that God exists. Okay, so we'll get to some of that. Paul uses that. Um, he wouldn't have framed it like these, you know, these different uh, titles that we've given to him. There's a cosmological argument the cosmos, the world, that from creation we know God exists. If these things are true and all that we see, he's going to do that. He's going to go there. There's an ontological argument, which has, which has a, a function of, of being. If, there is, if these things are true, there has to be a God. And they don't necessarily have to be the things you see, but we're going to dive into some of that. He talks about that. And he goes at it from a very different and unusual angle here. And it's really what some would call the moral argument that C.S. Lewis and others have made popular. And it starts with verse 18. Look at verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God. He starts with the wrath of God, which is really wild. And y'all, this this confronts our intellect. It challenges our, our understanding in the modern West where we go, that's the problem. That's why I struggle with God. I mean, you're starting with his wrath. Like he gets, he's angry. He's really mad, God. And some of us heard that kind of preaching maybe all of our lives. And we're like, I can't. I talked to someone after the first service, this reconciliation of how do you, uh, God of the Old Testament up against God of the New Testament. And I, no, 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 no. They're one and the same. In fact, listen, I'm going to offer this from the very start. Um, probably, if, you're, if you listen to podcasts while you're in the car or whatever else you might be doing, It's a great podcast that would help you with a lot of questions we're having here. It's called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. If you want to write that down. The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. And Justin Briley is the guy who hosts it. It is fascinating. And he talks to all kinds of people. Uh, and there's a bunch of episodes, so it'll take you a long time to listen to, but, um, but it's awesome. And what he's doing is he's talking about where formerly 10, 15 years ago, if any of y'all track this kind of stuff, um, again, this is the world I live in, but uh, there was, there was a, the rise of the new atheists, they were called. Um, people like Richard Dawkins, people like Christopher Hitchens, some of these names, Sam Harris. Um, there's uh, others who were a part of that whole group. Um, this week, in fact, interesting, this week, Richard Dawkins, one of the primary um, atheists, of the new atheists in particular, wrote a book called The God Delusion, started to see a little, little rise of, of, of um, you know, intrigue and interest, again, some 10, 15 years ago. Uh, this week, he comes out and says that now he's, he says he's a cultural Christian. This guy, I'm talking about angry atheist. Um, back in the day. He would have never said this. Now, what he means is, though, this can be quite destructive, in fact. What he means is he's not a believing Christian. And you're like, what? And there's others, a guy like Tom Holland, who's a, who is an atheist historian, um, great historian, but he calls himself a, an, a, a Christian atheist. Meaning, Meaning, here's what they're seeing. People like Jordan Peterson, you might know that name. Guys who are saying, you know what? Everything that's right and good about the world uh, comes from Christianity. So, I mean, atheists are even saying this. And when, uh, 
when Richard Dawkins says he's a cultural Christian, he means, you know, I like churches and, you know, the songs and all that they do. That's really sweet stuff. Uh, I don't really care that Christianity is in decline. That doesn't bother me a whole lot. In fact, maybe I like it. But it's better than the alternatives that are out there. And he, and he names other religions. Um, and, and so he's not saying he's a believer. And so people like uh, Jordan Peterson would say that Christianity is metaphorically true, allegorically true, even categorically true. Like the idea that we talk about, creation, uh, fall, redemption, restoration. The idea in these philosophical thinkers is that all of this is really great framework to understand life. And then this idea of enemy love, and gosh, the sacrifice of Jesus, the, the, whole, the whole framework of redemption. Oh, it's beautiful and wonderful, metaphorically true. And what Paul is going to show us and what I want us to, and what many of us know, if it's not historically true, it all finds its source in Jesus, the person of Christ, God in the flesh. If it's not historically true, it all breaks down then none of it makes sense. You can't claim that it's, I mean, you can claim it's allegorically true and say this is a great way to live. And what's happening, here's my point. What's happening, the, the, the new atheists have now, they're, now there's this big shift in people going, you know, the secular store's not working. We got a lot more questions. Uh, but wow, this framework really works. And the very thing, the, the, how about this? The water we swim in is Christian because the gospel has gone forth throughout the world and has impacted lives all over the place. And the very best things we see in cultures around the world come from the truth of God and his word. So Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And what he's doing is he's pointing us to then, um, he starts with, I went a long way to say this, the wrath of God. Watch this. This is important to understand. The wrath of God is his holy reaction to sin. It's not just God going off, out of control, angry. That's what we think of, because that's what we do. God's not out of control. He's never out of control. He's totally in control. His wrath is against sin. And Paul is going to say from the start, interesting place to start, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all, un all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress, underline, suppress the truth by their wickedness. All right, who, who suppress their truth by their wickedness. Since, now watch what he says, what, what, what may be known, what is known and can be known about God is plain to them. Paul's like me, he, and like a lot of us, he, I can see him going, oh my gosh, it's evident, it's clear, it's plain and seen because God has made it plain to them. Other translations say, made it plain within them. God has built like within our hearts a homing device. We know that he exists. We know that there's something more. And some of you would say, well, no, I know, I know atheists. I know some people who claim to be, uh, I'm kind of used to be there, you know, kind of a thing. We'll talk about that. Um, because he's saying that we all know. And how is it that we know? Well, we know because of a real righteousness, he says. And here's what I mean. Um, here's what he means, okay? They're, they're, he's saying that there is right and wrong in the world and everybody knows it. Now you say, nah, I got a sociopath friend. I don't think they know that there's all the right or wrong. Every culture, you know, they, okay, killing is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. Now when I say that, then we enter into wars, right? Well, let's go kill others. But what we see here is he's saying that if you're going to claim that there is evil in the world, God's wrath toward his holy reaction to sin is seen in a lot of ways in our world. One is the consequences that we face in a broken world. You could start there. Here's a starting point for our atheist agnostic friends, all of us. Um, something's wrong. This world is messed up. You agree? Yep. And in fact, that's why I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God because all the evil in the world. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa. What did you say? Did you say evil? That's a moral claim. That's a spiritual claim. And I've discovered this. Some people, politicians and others, in fact, they're not going to use the word evil because they're smart enough to know that's a spiritual designation. That's actually a biblical, that's a biblical framework. The point being that when we say that things are broken, 
that things are, are, are fallen, we would say that's what we call sin. That's sin. Reveals you have to then have the opposite of it. How do you know that? What do you mean evil? I mean, up against like good. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So there's a righteousness, right? The opposite of that is what we would call sin and brokenness. So it's kind of a strange, maybe through the back door way, but he's saying God reveals himself through, we all know this is true, through the consequences of our own sin. It's the wrath of God revealed against sin. God hates sin. You say, wait, God hates? Wait, 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 what? What is, what is he angry about? Well, he's angry about the fact that people have turned away from him, and now he's going to argue then that, that they're turning towards those things that have been created. God does get angry, and he gets angry because he loves us so much. Here, here's, here's, here's how we can say it. Um, the wrath of God proves that he is holy, just, and loving. That's why we hear so many people arguing for justice in the world, right? Where does that come from? See, ultimately, love, justice, righteousness, whatever is right or wrong, the moral argument is it all points to an ultimate right, an ultimate righteousness. And this righteousness is revealed in our daily lives through the consequences of our own sin, and we see it throughout, throughout the world. Now, that sounds like a rather convoluted argument, but what Paul is going to do is he's going to continue to point us to why things are the way they are. Now watch this. He says, he said earlier, he says that we, uh, we suppress the truth. That's the problem. You can't suppress something you don't have. It's been revealed and those who do not believe are constantly suppressing the truth. That's why I've said that the atheist is like the guy who went out and bought him a new boomerang and he almost killed himself trying to throw away his old boomerang. It just kept coming back to him. <laughs> there is no God. Whoa, what was that? There is no God. <laughs> a baby's born. Whoa, how, what is this? What am I feeling right now? There's no God. <laughs> That's the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my, it blows my mouth. <laughs> there's no God. Hey, there's an eclipse coming up this week. How do we know that? Order and design, maybe. How is it that the moon, <laughs> a friend of mine told me this this week. Do you know why there's this perfect alignment of a total eclipse? It's like God winking at us. I mean, this is really cool. The reason is, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, and the sun is 400 times further away than the moon. Oh, just by, you know, again, coincidence. Just, just happens. You have to explain these things. That's why Paul is like, it's clear. It's been seen, and it's obvious. For in, in, verse, in verse 20, look at this. In verse 20, we see now, let's, let's shift gears now. Now we're going to talk about a real revelation, all right? So he's revealed himself through his righteousness. Now we're going to move to a real revelation. Verse 20, for since, here we go, the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and, and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in creation. The psalmist says, uh, the heavens declare his glory. I mean, even get down to the, to the micro level, I had a nurse come up after our, 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 uh, our, our first service and saying, have you ever heard? And she went off on all kinds of things about the body, you know, that, that reveal God's clear design. We all know this, right? It's the old watchmaker analogy. If you find a watch out in the woods somewhere, you don't pick it up and go, wow, that just came out of nowhere. You go, no, there's a creator. There's a watchmaker. And then the eye that sees 3D in color, a brain that, you know, is, we could argue, greater than any, anything known to man, any computer, our hearts. What is love if there is no God? Chemical reaction, an evolved state, animal instinct. We all know that it's more than that. He says it's clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Without excuse. 
You can say, well, I know, I know, I know some atheist friends. I mean, they're real deep thinkers and all the things. And well, no, they're suppressing the truth, constantly suppressing the truth. The invisible qualities of God continue to be revealed, and we see it. There's a real righteousness that's been revealed. There's a, a moral argument that says there is good and bad, and an ultimate good has to be behind all that. Uh, we could go down the list. If there's love in the world, there's an ultimate love, a lover who is the one. And the Bible says who is love, right? So all of it points to him. And then finally, there's a real redemption. And I want to unpack this a little bit more here because it doesn't seem like things are right in the world. But God is making everything right. Uh, you say, well, didn't he see this coming? Like, I mean, we got creation. It was all perfect. As I understand it, everything was great intimate uh, relationship with God, and then, then we decided to blow the thing up. Did he not see this coming? Um, of course he did. He's God. What's happening there? Well, true love is chosen love. He gives us freedom to choose to love him or not to love him. We pay the consequences, natural consequences, you could say supernatural consequences, for not loving the God who created us. This is what he's mad about, if you will. The wrath of God is revealed. He's angry that we have suppressed the truth, turned from him to worship the created rather than the created. So a real redemption has come. Let's look at this. Verse 21. Here's what's happened. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, meaningless, and their foolish hearts were hardened. Here's what's happening. Suppress the truth long enough. And God will say, you want to live as if I don't exist? Good luck with that. Have at it. Let's see how that goes. And y'all, we've all been there in varying degrees. But it's all in view of redemption. It's all in view of saying, okay, experience life without me because you're going to be longing to have life with me <laughs> is what's happening there. And we're the ones that are choosing. We're suppressing the truth. We're moving away from him, right, is what's happening here. And so what we see throughout uh, this passage is that it, he continues to show us what's going on. Now, look at verse, uh, look at verse 22. Although they claim to be wise, yeah, they, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. Birds and animals and reptiles. And this was, you know, truly back in the day, worshiping idols and such. We do the same. We've just created our own idols. Therefore, here it is, verse 20, 24, God gave them over. You suppress the truth. God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Our students are uh, today... And a new series they're going through in their connect groups, they're talking about um, a, a, a biblical view of, Christ, of, of a Christian vision of sexuality. We're going to talk about that uh, here in this series as well. Radical devotion to, to holiness and what that, what that looks like. Therefore, God gave them over. Uh, and then it says in verse 25, it says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. He lands with, you know, he's like, yes, it's shouting time. Let it be so, is what he's saying. You suppress the truth long enough, you pay the price. And we all do this in varying degrees. This week we read in our dwell reading um, that it says, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To reverence him, to, to see him with awe and wonder, to believe and to worship him is where we find, where we find wisdom in the world, right? So let's get back to what Paul is saying, because all of this points to what God is up to in the world. And it's, he says this again in verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, okay, because it's the power of God uh, for all who, who, who believe. It's, it brings salvation to us. What is this gospel? 
The gospel is the good news that has come to us in Jesus. Yes, things are broken. Yes, they're not the way they ought to be. But as you consider Paul's premise here, it goes from general revelation down to more and more specific, more and more specific, all the way to the person of Jesus. And at the point of the spear is Jesus who's come to bring the good news of the gospel. It's why in the first chapter of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter one writes this. In the past, all right, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. You see the funnel? At many times and in various ways, all right? But now in these last days, we're in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, clearly through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Now, wait, what? Like some of us think, well, I thought Jesus just kind of showed up for a while. Like he was, he created everything? God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ created all things for his, perf- for his purpose. What we say here is, how do you know who God is and what he looks like? People, you know, how do you know, Jeff, that, that God exists? Because you do. Okay, this is what Paul is getting to. It's simple Aristotelian logic. It's cause and effect, right? How do you know you, I mean, I don't need the Bible for this. How do you know God exists? Because look. That's what Paul is saying here. And not only look, are you kidding me? But creation shows us what he's like. He's beautiful. He's wonderful. There's order. There's design. He is the ultimate intelligence. And this is going to become more and more true as we get into more AI and more artificial intelligence, where people wonder what is real anymore. And we're going to continue to point them to the one who is real. You see, the one who has come to us, Jesus is perfect theology in the flesh. We say it often. And if your theology, your doctrine doesn't match up with the person of Jesus, then shown up in your life, you're doing it wrong because he's revealed himself perfectly to us. And so you want to know what God is like? Uh, you want to know if he exists? Well, you do. Okay, cause and effect. You can't get something from nothing. You can't get living matter from, from non-living matter again. But, but you, you now, look, what is he like then? And this is what this whole series is about. Uh, he's like Jesus. We don't look at Buddha to figure out who God is. Very distinctively Christian. We don't look at Muhammad to figure out who God is. We look at Jesus. I could, argue, I could say it this way. This sounds a little weird. We don't look at God to figure out who God is. We look at God. We, we look at Jesus to know who God is. In the flesh, perfect theology, embodied, practiced. To be like him is to be like God and to fulfill our purpose for why we were created. Jesus Christ, perfect theology, embodied. And it's why what what, what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe. I just want to encourage you today because many of us are here. I, I don't see him, but I believe because the spirit of God has revealed himself to, to me. And I'm filled with an expressible, inexpressible, glorious joy for you are receiving even now the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's saying, if you hang in there, continue to fight the good fight of faith, continue to to believe, and Lord, help me with my unbelief. As you walk through the struggles of this world, you'll continue to learn more and more about who he is, and you're already on track. And the end result of your faith is the salvation of your souls. So here's what I want to do. Go back to Hebrews chapter 1, where it says, in the last days, he's revealed himself to us. And then in verse 3, It says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The sun is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his being, right? Sustaining all things through his powerful word after he had had provided purification for sins. This is the gospel that Paul talks about in, in in the first chapter of Romans. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven, meaning he's now in that place of authority over all things. And the more we give our lives to him, the more we experience all that life is supposed to be in the here and now. And so 1 John 4, 8 puts it this way. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, this is an important fact. 
It's this, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper together. You can say that you believe in God. You can even come to church uh, every week, I suppose. You can read the Bible every day and not realize that the Bible and all that we're doing through our dwell, dwell reading, the Bible points us to Jesus. The scriptures show us there's, there's, there's cause and effect. There, there's creation. There, it reveals who God, that there is a God. And the scriptures show us through the prophets, through, the, through all that's happening through redemptive history, pointing the whole Bible points to Jesus. We say that often. Everything points to him. And he is the creator of all things. He's the savior. He's the one who has revealed himself to us. Yes, he's our, again, he's, he's our example. He's that, but he's first our substitute who makes everything right. And, and the wrath of God was poured out on sin in Jesus. And so you can believe all of these things, but friends, if we don't show the world that God is love by the way we love, then we've missed the mark altogether. And that's a problem in our world today. Because, here it is in the end, love is the proof. Love is the proof. And the way that we love others is proof, not only that God exists, we're also revealing who he is. Love is proof that you belong to him. In fact, John says, if you don't love, you don't belong to him. You're fooling yourself. And yes, we don't do this perfectly. None of us do that perfectly. But we continue to grow in the Lord and become more and more like him. And so the way that we do that is to always recalibrating all the time back to his great love for us. So he told us, when you gather, well, I want you to do this. And he showed the, the, the disciples in the upper room the Lord's Supper. He brought new meaning to the Passover meal, the first exodus, the first covenant. And now it's through the blood of Jesus that we are set free, his perfect sacrifice upon the cross. So I want us to pray together. And then we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together, right? Just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Now we come to really a holy moment. This is for all who believe. And I, I, before we get there, I just want us to rest in this moment. We have time to just rest in this moment. That will not come again for you exactly like this uh, for the rest of the week. But as you've gathered with other believers here, you're encouraged the songs have really um, set you free today, even reminded you of who you are and how much you're loved. His word has reminded you that he exists and that he loves you and he's calling you to himself. And it all comes down to Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Where the righteousness of God was revealed through his wrath, he hates sin and he hates what sin does to us. And that points to his holiness, how loving he is and how good he is. And so he pours out his wrath on his son, Jesus, as our substitute so that we would not take on the brunt of, of the effects of sin and the wrath of God. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've done that for us. And I pray for every person here who has never made a, a decision that today would be the day. And friend, if you have never received Christ, now is the time. Barriers perhaps have been broken down for you today and now it's time to say yes to him. He's calling you to say yes. To say, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. So, Lord, thank you. You, re you receive all glory and honor and praise. You're the one who deserves all things from us. And so we give you our lives anew now, thanking you for the sacrifice you made for us on the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen.